Hi everyone, welcome to Visit LICM at Home. I'm Melissa Sorvillo and I'm the Social Media Manager at Long Island Children's Museum. My colleagues and I have been working to put together this video series for you that helps replicate the museum experience. We're all sad that we can't be there at the museum with you, but we're excited that we can do all of this with you in your home. The mission of the museum is connecting all our community's children and those who care for them to one another and a life of wonder, imagination, and exploration. So that's exactly what we're gonna do here today with so many fun different activities. So Rebecca, are you ready? Mm -hmm. Let's gather up the ones we love and we're gonna get those materials together that they share um, at the beginning of each segment to explain what we're gonna be doing and Let's get started. You ready? Mm -hmm. All right. Up first, we have the gecko. Gecko. Gecko, gecko. Gecko, gecko. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Marissa, and today I wanted to give you guys a short lesson on one of the museum's favorite animals, our crested geckos. So this is my friend Mo. Mo is actually kind of special because she's my personal pet. She was the first successfully bred gecko at the museum. So she lives here in my home with me. So um, she is called a crested gecko because if you can see on the side of her head, she has these little tiny spikes. Oh, there you go. She has these little tiny spikes that go around the edge of her head and above her eyes. Sometimes they're referred to as eyelash geckos. She is from a place called New Caledonia, which is an island off the coast of Australia. One interesting thing about them is that they were thought to be extinct until there was a large storm in 1994 and all of a sudden there were so many more geckos. Uh, she is arboreal. So an arboreal animal is an animal that lives way high up in trees. And in order to live in a tree, you have to be good at three main things. One of them is climbing, the second one is jumping, and the third is falling. She's pretty good at all of those things, which makes her well adapted for a life high up in the trees. Um, she is a good climber because her feet are covered in these tiny little hairs that are called sita, and those sita help her to cling on to things. So she's able to climb on glass, she climbs on me, she could climb on the ceiling if she wanted to, she could get just about anywhere. Um, she has a tail that helps her also. Uh, so if she was falling out of a tree, she would use this instinctually. It is a semi prehensile tail. She also does a really cool thing with her tail. It's called dropping her tail. And what would happen is if we were in the wild and an animal were chasing her and got her by the tip of her tail, she can make the decision to drop the tail and leave it behind. So it would drop away from her body, totally disconnect right about here and then it would kind of flip around and wiggle around and it might distract the predator for a minute and let her get away. The only bad thing about this defense is that with this type of lizard, they cannot regrow their tail. So some lizards can and some lizards can't and unfortunately crested geckos can't. So it's a one shot deal. Uh, let's see, they are nocturnal, which means that most of the time when I see her out in her cage is when it's dark out and she'll be looking for food or maybe getting some exercise. Their diet is kind of interesting. Uh, she is an omnivore and I know a lot of you probably know that means she eats both plants and animals, but she is specifically a frugivore, which is an animal that enjoys eating fruit and an insectivore, which means, I'm sure you guessed it, that she likes to eat bugs. So she gets a fruit smoothie every day and then she gets some worms or crickets as a substitute in her diet also. Uh, in captivity, they live about 20 years, so that's a pretty nice long life. And they do breed pretty easily in captivity. I told you that she was the first successfully bred one at the museum and we've since then had about 15 more babies. So if you're ever at the museum and you look at the cage right next to the adult geckos, that's our hatchling tank. And you can usually find a few cute, very small babies in there. So that's about it for me. If you guys have any questions about the geckos, be sure to put them in the comments and I'll try to get to them. I think she might want to jump to you guys. Let's see. <laughs> oh, there she goes. Bye guys. <laughs> Thanks, Marissa. Up next, we have Austin Costello from the LICM Theater. 
Hi, I'm Austin Costello, resident puppet artist at Long Island Children's Museum Theater, and today we're going to be talking about puppets. Yes, puppets. Now, surely everybody at home has played with puppets before, maybe built some puppets, but did you know that puppets have a terrific history all around the world? First of all, a puppet is an inanimate object which somebody, called a puppeteer, makes animate. Now, what does that mean? That means that there is an object that is not alive that an actor called a puppeteer brings to life. Since there have been groups of people living together, there has been puppetry. Uh, the first kind of puppet I'm going to show you is the shadow puppet, which goes back thousands and thousands of years. For example, I have my cell phone making a light back here, and this screen, which is much like a shower curtain. Then, you take a shadow puppet, which can be cut out, it can be your hands, and you project the light over the puppet, and it creates a shadow. Here you see the Bremen Town musicians, which are fairly simple cutout. Here's a bird from Southeast Asia, which is very, very intricate. And then from Turkey in the Middle East, here's a man with an umbrella. So shadow puppets can have color, too. Then another kind of puppet is called the marionette, or string puppet, which is controlled from above by frequently wooden rods or wooden handles, and then from that you have your puppet strung, in the case of this pterodactyl. And then we have rod puppets. They're called rod puppets because they're worked from below using sticks that we call rods. In this case it's a trigger mechanism puppet too. Ho ho ho! Merry Christmas everyone! <laughs> When a lot of people think of puppets, they think of Punch and Judy, which are an example of what's called a glove puppet, which works just by putting your fingers up into the head of the puppet. In this case, I'm doing this. So these puppets can be very, very simple. Or sometimes more complex. And then we have full body puppets like Sheila and Wally, who are puppets that the performer wears. Now you might see these at a sports game or on TV. Like for example, Big Bird is an example of a full body puppet and a hand puppet, which is a great transition to hand puppets. You have surely seen hand puppets all over the place, uh, especially on TV and in films with the work of Jim Henson and the Muppets. Uh, now, I absolutely love hand puppets. I'm most proficient in them. I work for Sesame Street uh, when I'm not at Long Island Children's Museum in the theater, uh, and it is a really, really cool time. Uh, hand puppets are really, really fun and take a lot of actual work to get really, really good at. Uh, we're going to get into how to work a hand puppet later on, but for now... Let's start making a sock puppet. There are many different ways to make a sock puppet, but how we're going to do it today will require a few things. We'll need a sock, thin cardboard or plastic, a marker, a scissor, glue, and decoration. Before you begin making your sock puppet, you want to have an idea of what you want it to look like. For example, I found this nice colored sock that I had as a spare here in my puppet shop. Now a very important rule of making sock puppets is do not cut apart anything but a stray sock without your grown-up's permission. Uh, don't go digging through your drawers and cutting up dress socks that may be very expensive or some fun socks that you might need. However, if you find a fun sock that is a stray, he is a great candidate to be a sock puppet. Now there are a bunch of different ways to begin with a sock puppet. First, by putting it on your arm. Uh, and deciding what kind of a mouth you might want. I found that there are a few different ones. There's one where you can tuck in the end of the sock and you end up with a mouth like lamb chop, like this, kind of a little fish mouth. Or you can pull it out a little bit more and kind of get the stereotypical sock puppet mouth. But today, I'm going to teach you how to make a sock puppet in the way that I was taught by one of the Muppet performers, uh, where you can use kind of cardboard or plastic to make a really good, what's called a mouth plate, uh, that you can use with your hand. This guy's a lot more puppety looking and less sock looking. Why, thank you. You're welcome. So here are the materials we need to make our sock puppet. Uh, the first thing you want to do is bend your cardboard or plastic in half. Uh, this is a really good step to make sure that you have a joint at the back of the mouth 
for where the puppet's mouth will open and close. And then, once you've had that folded in half, you want to trace your hand. And you only want to go up to the L of your thumb, just like this. So you go, whoop, careful not to get any Sharpie on your fingers. And there you have what will be the pattern for your mouth plate. From there, go ahead and cut that out. I'm doing this rather quickly, but you could take all the time and care you want when you make yours. And so now you can see you have a, an opening and closing mouth, just like that. You want to take your sock and turn it inside out. And where you find that the toe seam is, that's going to go at the back of the mouth, here where my thumb is. So what you want to do is lay your sock out flat, then take your glue. You can use white glue or hot glue. I use hot glue because it's quicker, but please be careful because it's hot for a reason. And I'm going to line it up, load it up with hot glue, if my hot glue gun wants to cooperate. Just put a couple of dots. Boop, boop, boop. And another few dots. Boop, 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 boop. And then I'm going to bite this mouth around the tip of the toe. And I'm going to put it right around and close it. Just like that. So your sock should look like this at this point. Then from there, you want to turn the sock right side out again and pull the cardboard into it. Like so. And from there, you have your working mouth plate. Hello. And this is my favorite part when we get to put the finishing details on the puppet. Uh, from here, it's totally up to you what you want to use. In this case, I'm going to use a half a styrofoam egg and some fake fur. And for the pupils on the eyes, I'm going to use chair pads. You can use buttons, you can use yarn, you can use anything you have stray around the house to make your puppet. Be creative, have fun. And now, we would like to welcome into the world our brand new sock puppet. Uh, now, this puppet has a lot of, lot of movability in his head. He gets a whole lot of really fun expressions just by moving your fingers around. Uh, and on that, moving your fingers. So to make the puppet talk, a lot of people when they do hand puppets, they want to talk like this. They want to flap their hand open and up. Uh, but the way the Muppets work, for example, they just move the thumb, or as much as they can just move the thumb. So try doing that. Try just moving your fingers and thumb and go, hello, hello, one, two. Now let's count to ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now the trickiest of them is always seven because it's seven, one, two. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So the more you do it, the better you're going to get. And with your sock puppet, you have a great reason to practice. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, thank you for counting with me and for building uh, a new me and friends for me too. Now sock puppets and all kinds of puppets can be a lot of fun, but they are really used for telling stories. When you watch any of Sesame Street or The Muppets or any films that have puppets in them, they're all being used to tell stories. So now that you have a sock puppet, you and friends and your folks at home, anybody can make a sock puppet and you can tell stories with them. You can do fairy tales or nursery rhymes or make up your own stories. What kind of things do your puppets like? What do they not like? Do they like eating crazy food? Do they live somewhere really fun? Uh, are they mad? Are they happy? Are they sad? What do they do for a living? You have so many, so many, so many creative options you could do with sock puppets now. So go out and tell stories and have a whole lot of fun together. Thanks, Austin. That was so cool. Our family didn't have time to do it along with you because we were so engrossed in watching what you were doing, but we will definitely be making our own sock puppets tomorrow. Up next, we have Amy Trizuli with some brain teasers utilizing a component from one of the most popular galleries at the museum. Do you know which gallery has over 10,000 pieces in that one gallery alone? That would be the Kiva Gallery. So Kiva planks can be used for a lot of different things, but Amy's going to show you a unique way next. If you want to follow along and you don't happen to have Kiva at home, you can just use anything that she points out or even marker or a pencil on paper to draw the things that you see made with Kiva planks. 
Hi everyone, this is Amy here, Director of Education and Visitor Experience. We know Kiva is a fan favorite at the museum, and we also know you're used to building in 3D, but did you know you could also build in 2D? We also can do tons of brain teasers. So let me walk you around my kitchen island and show you some things you can do. So we know, again, you're used to building very high and in 3D, but did you know that you can, if you don't have Kiva, it's not a big deal, you can use toothpicks, I found some candles here. I also found some, some uh, Q-tips. You can use anything long and thin, paper, or you could just draw these problems out. Also, you know, spaghetti could work. So look around the house for something long and thin, kind of like a Kiva plank. So let's walk around and see our first challenge. So here's our first challenge. It's kind of a math problem, but it's a math problem that is wrong, and we need you to correct it. So what we're gonna do here is you are allowed to move one plank, just one, one plank, and see if you could correct this problem. I'll wait, freeze the video for, before you get the answer. Are you ready? All right, don't start it again until you solve the problem. All right, if you're back, it's probably because you've solved it. So there actually was two ways by moving this plank right here, we could have made it a correct so the problem, seven minus two equals five. Or you could have done it another way. This had two answers, which um, seven minus two is not three, but one plus two does equal three. So there's the answer to one. Let's go to the next puzzle. Here's the next puzzle. Here, we're gonna ask you to remove one plank to make two squares. One plank, two squares. All right, freeze the video if you're gonna try to figure it out. Okay, if you're back, it's because you figured it out. By removing one plank, it's kinda tricky. I have made, here's the plank I took away, I have made a big square and a little square. Two squares, kinda tricky. Let's go on to the next one. So here, you are going to make three triangles by moving two planks. Three triangles by moving two planks. Okay, freeze the video if you wanna figure it out. I'll wait. All right, if you're back, it's because you figured it out. So what we are going to do is we are gonna move one plank here, creating two triangles, and then slide this one over here, now creating three triangles. Good job if you figured it out. All right, we're working our way around here. So this is my fun giraffe made out of Kiva planks. So what we're gonna do here is we can move one plank to change the direction of my giraffe. One plank changing the direction. Okay, freeze the video if you're trying to figure it out. If you're back, it's because you figured it out. Great job. What you do is you just slide this one over here. Now my giraffe is walking in a different direction. Great job. All right, the last challenge we have here is super tricky. So you can see this is my chair and I need to turn my chair right side up. You get to move two planks, two planks to correct this puzzle. All right, freeze the video and see how you do. If you're back, it's because you figured it out. You are gonna move one plank to the top over here, and then I'm going to move this plank over here. Flipping my chair the correct way. Looks super comfy. All right, everyone, have a great day, and keep working with Kiva, or reminder, you can use anything, toothpicks, mat, you could use Q-tips, anything you'd like, anything long and thin. Have fun. Up next, clear some space to get ready for some music and movement with Tanya and her son. Hi, I'm Tanya Holder and I'm Associate Director of Administration at LICM. I'm joined by my son's hooray. We're stuck inside, but we're gonna move anyway. We've got some drums to keep the beat and we're hoping that you'll move along with us. You ready to write? Mm -hmm. All right, let's go. Let's pick some apples, okay?
Thanks, Tanya. Up next, we have Claire Flynn with a science experiment. Hi, friends. It's Claire here. As the STEM Initiatives Program Director at the museum, I teach a lot of different science programs. I wanted to share an easy experiment that you can do at home with the things that you might have lying around the house. So you are going to be color detectives today. Did you know that the ink that's found in your markers is actually made up of lots of different shades? So purple is not just purple, and blue is not just blue. So we are going to be using a process called paper chromatography today to separate the pigment found in your marker ink to see what shades are really there. So in order to do this experiment, you will need a couple of things. So you'll need some coffee filters, a pair of scissors, a pencil, some tape, and a glass. So that glass could be a jar like I have here, it could be a little cup. It could be a measuring cup. So the most important things about your cup have to be that they are clear. So all of these cups here are clear. We can see through them. And that it will hold a little bit of water. The last thing that you will need are markers. So whatever colors you would like to have, it doesn't really matter, as long as your markers are washable. So they have to be washable markers because we are using water to separate the pigment. And so they have to be water soluble. They have to be able to break down in water so that they can move from place to place. So the first thing that we are going to do is to put a little bit of water in your cup. It doesn't have to be a lot. So you can see here, maybe it's about a half an inch of water, just enough to kind of cover the bottom. The next thing that you want to do is cut up your coffee filters so that you have some long strips. And the size strip that you want is going to depend upon what glass you have. So this jar is kind of tall, so I would want a piece that came probably from the middle of my coffee filter. But if I was using a glass like this, I might want one that was closer to the end because it's going to be shorter. So that's going to depend upon the cup that you have. So we are going to be drawing a dot of color onto our coffee filter and putting it into our jar of water so that the water can move up the coffee filter and then separate those pigments. When we get to this step where you put your coffee filter in the water, you want to make sure that your color that you drew does not touch the water. So to make sure that we're putting it in the right place, I'm going to line up my filter with my jar here. I'm going to make note of where the water is, and then I'm going to use my pencil to draw a line above where the water was. Right, I have my line here so that I know where to draw my dot of color. So I'm going to do a blue dot. Blue is my favorite color. So on top of that line, I'm going to draw a nice deep blue dot. I recommend that when you are coloring, you do it on top of a piece of paper so that you don't get your marker ink all over your table. So here you can see my nice blue dot. I want to be able to make sure that my coffee filter doesn't fall. So I'm getting a little piece of tape ready so that when I place my coffee filter into my water, I can tape it in place onto my pencil. So there you can see the coffee filter is now touching the water. The water is moving up the coffee filter by a process called capillary action. And right now it has not yet met where I drew my big blue dot of color, but it will. And when it touches that, it's going to start to interact with the ink. And it's going to, as it travels, it's going to separate the pigment. So this is an experiment that takes a little bit of time. I have one that I set up about a half an hour ago. You can see it's still going. The pigment has only reached about halfway through, so it still has time 
to separate into different colors. I have one that I started earlier. It took about 45 minutes to get to this point. So this could be something that you check in on every five or 10 minutes. It could be something that maybe you do want to watch it for the entire 45 minutes and see how it changes. But in this one, this started off just as a blue dot, just like this one right here. And now we can see a really brilliant kind of violet, a deep blue, kind of a turquoise color. So all of those different shades were hidden within that one blue marker. So have fun, try lots of different colors, and let us know what you find out. Thanks, Claire. To everyone watching at home, please do share photos of your chromatography experiments in the comments below, or pictures of any of the projects that we've been doing here today. Up next, we have Jean Marie, who's leading an art tutorial that also helps us tap into our emotions today or any day. Hi, my name is Jean Marie. I'm the Associate Director of Education at the Long Island Children's Museum. And just like you, I'm at home with my kids and I'm trying to find fun things that we can do while we're home as a family. And so what I'm gonna do today is show you something fun that you can do with your kids that's art-based and can help your kids express their emotions through color. So I have my kids, Dylan. Hi. And Penny here today and Hi. they're gonna help me out to do this lesson. And what you need really is just any kind of paper that you have at home, crayons, markers, paint, anything that you have at home will work. We're gonna be using markers and crayons today. Anything that has colors that you can draw or color with. And so today we're gonna to talk a little bit about colors and emotions. So can you two tell me what colors are happy colors for you? Um, um, pink. Pink's a happy color? Red. Okay, red, okay. What about a sad color? Blue. Blue purple. and purple. Is there a scared color? Yellow. Yellow? What about um, you? What do you think, Dylan? Scared. Brown. No, Brown. black. Black? Okay. Is there a color that's a silly color for you? Yeah. Yeah? Blue. Blue? What about you, Penny? Do you have a silly color? Rainbow. Rainbow. Ooh, that's a good one. Okay, there's also ways that you can show how you feel through lines, right, or shapes. So what would be a happy line, do you think? I'm gonna do a happy one and then you do one or two for me, okay? Here's my happy line. Okay, can you draw a scared line for me? Ooh, that's good, it's nice and jagged. That looks like a scared line to me. Penny, can you draw a tired line? Good, tired line, Penny. So lines and shapes can also express emotions too. So in our project today, Penny and Dylan, you're going to draw, I'll show you there, my happy line and Penny's tired line and Dylan's scared line. So today, you're going to draw on your paper lines and colors that show how you're feeling today. How are you feeling right now? Happy. Happy? Okay, what about you, Penny? Happy. Happy? Okay. What else were you gonna say, Dylan? Um, bored because st stuck away from school. Oh, because you don't get to go to school? Yeah. Well, this will be something fun, fun to do. Fun here, but there is something else sad. The person that's um, filming this is my dad, and we... Okay. Oh. We ready? We're going to get going. So, guys, do you want to use markers or crayons? Can I use both? You can use both, of course. That's a good, good point, Dylan. You can use more than one thing, too, to help draw your creations. Okay, so why don't you guys pick out the colors that make you feel happy and you can use that, okay? And we'll check back in as we've gotten going and we've got some uh, drawings started, okay? okay? I need to show you what we've done today. So Dylan and Penny and I did some drawings using colors and shapes to show our emotions. And so Dylan's gonna talk a little bit about his drawing now. And Dylan, can you tell us what colors you picked and why? And what shapes you made and why? Okay, so why I picked blue for happy is because it's my favorite color. It'll, if it wasn't one of my favorite colors, um, it would be sad for me. 
but since is it is um it's happy that's me I, I'm in a smiley face <laughs> um this lap yelling about something because it's so happy and then I wrote under it happy okay and then here's brown it's boring bored mm -hmm. for off from school and then I did another one it's a, it says uh and then <laughs> under it I wrote bored okay so that's a picture of you going uh bored because you're not at school yeah yep and happy here you are yelling hooray because you're happy no I'm yelling about something else oh about something else Okay, nice job, Dylan. I like how you used up the whole page, too. Penny, can you tell us a little bit about your drawing? This are all the colors in that the bunny with two carrots. Is the bunny yes. happy with two carrots? Yes, since it's Easter. And here's G I L O and Dylan. And here's Penny. And this is Mommy and Daddy. Cool. And Penny. What colors are the happy colors in this? So, black, uh, happy too, mm -hmm. pink, and blue and green, and this is a sad, and also tired and skin colors, tired too. The orange is tired, and that's tired and sad. And what about all the lines being all scratchy? Is mm -hmm. that happy or sad or something else? That means I'm get, that means I'm happy again. That means you're happy again? So that's good. You guys are mostly happy. Maybe a little tired and bored. Okay. Oh, and I can show you mine, actually. So I made mine happy with all these kind of energetic lines and shapes and lots of dots to remind me of the April showers and March showers that are going to bring some spring flowers. And then I have a little tired up in the corner because I'm a little bit tired today, too. You said a rhyme. I did say a rhyme. Thanks, Jean Marie. Everyone at home, make sure that you check out licm.org slash talkaboutart. This page of our website gives prompts for you to discuss your child's artwork with them or the artwork of others. Last but not least, we have Science Meets Art with Sarah. Hi everyone! Welcome to the Long Island Children's Museum Visit at Home. My name is Sarah and I'm the Museum Programs Coordinator and we're going to do a fun science experiment today. So to get started, we're gonna need a few things. We're gonna need a muffin tin. If you don't have a muffin tin, that's okay. You can find some bowls or some cups that you might find around the house, that will work too. Also, you're gonna need some baking soda, some vinegar. I ended up putting the vinegar into a smaller container so it'll just be easier for me later. You're going to use some measuring spoons or a regular spoon. Also, um, some food coloring. We have lots of different colors. Um, or if you have any watercolors in your art supplies that you can use. So I'm going to pause the video so you can gather all your materials and then we can do our experiments together. Okay. All right, friends, welcome back. We're going to get started with our science experiments. Okay, so right below you see is our muffin tin, and we're going to add some couple of drops to each of the cups. So I'm going to add one, two, three of blue, then we have yellow, next we have green, and then with the other muffin tins, we're going to see what colors we can combine. All right, so I'm going to do yellow and blue. And then I have another container that is red. Let's put red here and a little bit red here because we're going to mix red and yellow together. Okay, so the next step is you're going to grab your baking soda and you're going to either take your spoon or your measuring spoon and you're going to put the baking soda over your colors to cover them up. Can I just use a spoon? It's okay if some of them kind of peek through. The experiment will still work. Okay, we got that color. And a little bit more. Don't need too much, but just a little bit to cover it all up. 
All right, perfect. The next thing I was going to use is my vinegar that's inside this cup. I'm going to use a measuring spoon, it's a little bit easier. And I'm gonna see what happens when you pour vinegar and baking soda together. Let's see what happens. Whoa! Look at that color, we got blue. Do you know what color that is? We got yellow. Next we have, let's see, remember what color this is. Oh, I see it. it's coming through. We got some green. The next color is a lime green. Okay, let's see what the next one is. Gonna add a little bit more vinegar into my cup. And I think we need a little bit more for this one. Oh, we do, we see the red, and let's see what we remember this one to be. Ooh, it's so pretty, it looks like a, a sorbet kind of a color. So oh, yep, it's turning. It's definitely turning the orange, cool. And you adding more vinegar to see what happens you can let's see let's try this one out we'll do green and red who knows what happens when you mix green and red I don't actually know so we're gonna add some baking soda and you can kind of create your own colors and see what kind of new colors that you can combine together all right let's see see lots of green let's see if the red's gonna come through Oh, maybe we need a little bit more red. That's okay, we have some green. Well, I wanna say thank you guys for coming to join me in my home, making these really fun science experiments. And if you're not able to do it today, you can always come join me another day and to do it with me as well. Thank you so much, I had so much fun. It was great seeing everybody. Next time. Thanks, Sarah. That one was such a hit at our house and we are definitely gonna be doing that again soon. Plus, by moving it over to the sink, we were able to give it a good scrub afterwards with all that baking soda left behind. On behalf of everyone at the Children's Museum, I just want to say thank you for joining us today and thank you for following along and playing with us. We miss you. We look forward to seeing you again soon when we reopen. If you are brand new to the Children's Museum or have never been here before, well, not here because this is my house, but if you've never been to the Children's Museum before, um, hopefully we do get to see you there one day soon. If not, you can always follow along with us on social media where we will continue to provide resources. Please do comment below with any feedback you have about what you saw today. We would love to know what else you'd like to see or any pictures or any um, comments about the projects that you guys did while playing along. Thank you and take care.